Regina's life and work have been a series of incredible victories based upon her ability to stand in the present reality of her life and take firmly in her hands the opportunities before her. Her immense creativity and critical mind are on full display in our conversation. She reminds us all that we must courageously ask ourselves the questions, what is the goal of our hearts and what secret desires move us? And when the answers come, you have to move joyfully in the direction of your soul. Hello and welcome to another installment of At The Podium with me, Patrick Huey. At The Podium is a platform where we will learn from people who come from different walks of life, careers, and experiences, but all share one thing in common. They have stepped fully into the transformative power of saying yes to the unexpected turns of their lives. And they are now using the power of their voice, or podium, to make an impact on the world we live in today. At the podium is the intersection of art, culture, and big thoughts wrapped up in good old-fashioned conversation. Today, I'm thrilled and humbled to share the podium with Regina Bain. Regina Bain now serves as the executive director of the Louis Armstrong House Museum, known as LAM. She is an artist, leader, facilitator, and program designer with over 16 years of experience building non-profit capacity for organizational growth. Previous to her appointment at LAM, Ms. Bain served as Associate Vice President of the Posse Foundation, a national leadership and college access program which helps to send teams of students or posses to top colleges and universities. At Posse, Ms. Bain helped to onboard and provide oversight for executive directors in Posse's 13 site offices, and she helped to double Posse's STEM initiative. Ms. Bain's efforts helped to increase Posse's national student graduation rates for four consecutive years. Ms. Bain is committed to social justice. She facilitates and trains others to facilitate conversations on social identity, leadership, and group dynamics. She is currently the co-chair of Culture at Three's Anti-Racism Subcommittee. Ms. Bain serves on the National Advisory Council of Urban Bush Women, a dance company that galvanizes artists, activists, and audiences through performances, artist development, and community involvement. She produces the Drama Podcast, leads the Yale Black Alumni Association, and serves on the Yale Board of Governors. Ms. Bain earned her B.A. in African American Studies and Theater, from Yale University, and received her MFA from the Yale School of Drama. As part of the Louis Armstrong House Museum, Bain looks forward to joining a team that has fiercely shepherded and shared the story of Louis Armstrong for decades. The new Louis Armstrong Center will provide the space needed to expand his legacy of excellence in art, education, and community. Regina, welcome to At The Podium. I've known you for a long time. <laughs> we won't say how many years. Mm-hmm. But my beard was not gray when I met you. Tell me something that I don't know about you. I think you know most things. <laughs> but uh, I don't know if you knew I was a, a double Dutch queen back in the day. Uh, I used to love to double Dutch and I was in double Dutch competitions. It was amazing. And I say all that to say that at, at the heart of who I am, yes, I've, I've been an actress. I've been, I am an executive director. At my heart, I am a dancer. And there's something in the movement of double dutching that, that, that brings that up for me about what it means to, to find expression and voice through movement. And that, it, that, that identity, not necessarily that skill, <laughs> but that identity as a dancer, that my spirit is a dancer um, is, is not 
necessarily something that people know about me, but that is true and very important to me. I, I, I did not know that about you. Mm-hmm. I did not know that about you. So when we were at school and doing fame at the cabaret, that must have touched your soul. Deeply into my heart. And I remember this moment, I, I was playing Irene Cara. And um, I don't even know Irene, Irene Cara's actual, uh, the, who her character was. Coco, Coco, Irene Cara. And there was this moment when we were in rehearsal and I remember being at the piano and Bruno is playing and I'm saying, singing the song out here on my own. And I remember closing my eyes and feeling it so deeply, what it means at that moment to be a singer, but to be in the space of creativity, um, it felt right. So yes, fame, fame, I am still following all the threads of people who are, are threatening slash promising to bring that back. So I want, I want to see it because you, Mr. Huey, are there as, who was your character again? <laughs> I played Debbie Allen. Yes, you did. Lydia Grant. <laughs> yes, you did. And you were phenomenal. The cane, I mean, <laughs> yes. So that, the I am a dancer in my heart. Fame was a phenomenal experience. I hope to, we to, I hope we can have a moment to see that again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was, it's a beautiful movie. It, it, it still resonates for me. And I, and I think about that. That was probably one of the most, and we had some tough moments together at Yale in terms of the theatrical work we did. We had some really tough moments in trying to navigate some of the material we had to, to do. But the, the, fame, the fame material was quite exemplary. Even within the camp of it, it just, it just it resonated. It, is, it was true and joyful at the same time. And I think that is sometimes hard to come by. There are are theatrical experiences that are true, but don't feel good. And there are theatrical experiences that are joyful, but not quite true. And we know it. It's rare to find something that is both true and joyful. And that was fame for me. Tell me, you know, a, a lot of this, the show is really framed around saying yes to the unexpected in your life. What was that for you? Well, I think it was similar to what it was for you. And that was leaving Florida to say yes to Yale uh, as an undergrad. And I remember being in my car with my mother and she, we were in the parking lot and she, uh, she passed me the envelope and you could see through the envelope that it said, welcome. It was the big, the thick envelope. And I was so excited. Um, I also know now in retrospect and talking to my mother that that moment was one of, of sadness for her. It was, there's pride, but the sadness of, of knowing that I was going away. And because before I had been going away, but to, in Florida, <laughs> I was going to go to college in Florida, but this was, oh, she's going away. And so that moment of saying yes um, to that experience, I'm so thankful to the support system I had in my life. My mother also saying yes, because she could have said something different that would have been real and true for her. But she let that go. She put that aside in order to say yes to me. And I am so thankful. I am so thankful for that. I am too. I wouldn't have met you otherwise. Yeah. You know, you said something that I think is really profound. I don't know if you realized how profound it was. And I think I think we live in a time and maybe it's shifting because of what we've all been through as a, as a collective human race over the last 12 months. But I, I think you said something and we just reiterated it in this answer that joy and what feels good and what's right may not all be linked together. Because in the moment of you saying yes, to Yale, which is a great moment, probably of joy and fear for you. It's sadness and pride for your mother. And I think life lesson that these, these big moments of transition are quite complex and quite emotionally unsettling. 
mm-hmm. must nonetheless do what you must do. Yes. You must step into joy, which is a, is not the same as happiness, and move forward. And move forward with your, I think about Wesley again and what it means to move forward with your chest, with your, with your gut, with your whole self and spring forward. Yeah, got to do that. And, and keep making a choice to do that through your life. Because I, I wonder, I wonder how, how often I think about myself that I'm waiting for a feeling. And if you keep waiting for the feeling, you miss the moment. And I think, you know, I think that's one thing that happened in our training as actors and people always ask what the Yelp method of training is. And I'm like, I don't know what you're doing now, but back in what we were there, <laughs> you know, it probably hasn't changed that much. But, you know, we didn't talk a lot about our feelings in that training. We talked a lot about what we were doing and how you were feeling if you're my scene partner and what I was observing in you. But there was very little focus on what I felt. Mm. And I think we're in a moment now where we're all talking a lot about how we feel and what we think and what we believe. And that's important. It has its place. But that's not determinative. It's not dispositive. Mm-hmm. But just feel it, it's true. <laughs> and just because, you know, that's, that's just not part of it. You know, I think you just hit on that in a really profound way that this is a great moment for you and maybe not such a great moment for your mom. Yeah. Truth. But it is truth. That is true. And I hadn't really thought of our training in that way, that that it really was about what I remember of the training long ago um, was you had to make a choice about what you wanted. What do you want? What do you want? What does this character want? What did they want? All right. You want this? How are you getting it in this scene? It's not about how you feel. It's about how you're going to make the other person feel in order to get what you want. It's kind of Machiavellian, but but and maybe a, maybe a bad way of thinking about what humanity is. But I think is there's something to that. Um, is what do you want? What are you striving for? What does this person want? And it's not as simple as I want this job. Uh, I want to, this girlfriend. I want. It's it's. What is the what is the um, the goal of your heart, the secret desire that moves you? What do you want? And that I think is good training to to tap into. For life. For life. For life. What do you want? What do you really want? Mm-hmm. Yesterday, I was on a Zoom call with a friend of mine who I went to Vanderbilt with. She's now a school teacher and. Baton Rouge, Louisiana, she works with, um, I guess society would call them at-risk youth, but you know, whatever, you know what that means. Yes, I do. But I, I was coaching them on monologues and I, I, I instantly reverted back to who are you and what do you want? And when they really answered that question, it changed them. Mm-hmm. They feel the change, it was palpable even through the Zoom call. And I think it's, it's a great question we should all ask ourselves, who are you, what do you want? You know, and be prepared for an answer to make you say yes to something you didn't think you'd say yes to. Mm. You know, how did you do that though? How did you say yes to becoming this top businesswoman leading these really impressive organizations? Here you are, a Yale trained actress. You know, you, we were one of 17 out of maybe a thousand applicants. Mm. We're, you know, you had. <laughs> You sometimes have the world handed to you when you come out of these programs and, and yet you 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 said yes to Posse for many years and then you said yes to Louis Armstrong. Mm-hmm. How did you make that leap from Yale to that first yes and then the second yes? Well, education, always a part of my life and uh, I had to say yes to that. And one of the ways I did that was to say yes to a random phone call. So I had put my um, picture and my resume into a database. And it was the database for the people of color at equity, something, some random um, thing. But there was a woman who accessed that database and she was looking for people to hire because she had written a play um, based on the women's voices that she had re- uh, heard at the Rape and Crisis Awareness Center at Princeton. And she was writing a play based on those women's voices. 
and she needed people to be in the play. And so she accessed this database and found me and called me. And I picked up the phone and said, yeah, I'll come. I'll come do that. Random. And that woman was Dr. Tama Bryant Davis, who is um, a pastor, a leader now. And one of the other women who was involved in the production was Dr. Shirley Collado, who is the uh, president of Ithaca College. So she was there. Um, and at that time, she was working for Posse, and she was a Posse alum. And she said, hey, are you interested in uh, volunteering with our team? Um, because they work with young people that needs to be dynamic, with their, they need to facilitate. And I think an acting class would be great. I had never taught acting in that way. I had taught literature for students. I had taught Hamlet, but I hadn't taught acting, especially not for non-actors. Mm. I was like, okay. <laughs> so I said yes. <laughs> and ended up in a room with 30 incredible human beings who were passionate about youth, about cross-cultural dialogue, about power, and excavating conversations of power and putting it all on the table. And I said, hmm, I like this. <laughs> so I'm gonna keep volunteering with this. And that turned into full-time and that turned into 17 years. And moving through that, that space of being the first um, to, to be in my position, it was called the senior training specialist at that time, to being an associate vice president. And moving from learning facilitation skills, which was the critical core skill that anyone at Posse needs, to also learning about budgets and management. And um, I just had to keep saying yes, yes, yes. And I am thankful for Wesley for that, that advice to say yes. Who impacted you in your formative years? Who was that person? My mama. <laughs> you know, mamas. I had, of course, my mother. Of course, my grandmother, Wilhelmina Spires. Of course, my sister. Beyond my family, there's a woman's name, a woman's name I want to call, and this is Mrs. Deal. She was my kindergarten teacher. Mm. And she is the woman who pulled my mother aside and said, this child is smart. I want to put her into this gifted program. Here's what's going to happen. She's going to take a test and the test will come back this way. And the people who run that test will say, this is strange. We should test her again. And then they're going to test her again. And then they're going to say, wow, I, I don't think she's quite ready for it for this gifted program, but we should put her in this other program and that'll get her ready. And she pulled my mother aside and said, when that happens, this is what you need to do. And it's because Mrs. Deal, my kindergarten teacher, advocated for me that I did not get lost to the racism of the education system. Mm -hmm. And I am so thankful to Mrs. Deal because at that very early moment, she set me on a trajectory and yes, it, the gifted program wasn't necessarily going to be the make or break thing in my life, but it gave me poetry in a way that I hadn't, I still remember Mrs. G Giuliano and the poetry that she taught me. It gave me things very early that I'm thankful for. So Mrs. Dio, she did good things for me. You know, we're, we're gonna go a little off script here, but I, I think the education piece is very important. I was educated in primarily private black schools until I went to public school. It was the first time in my educational life that in a black private school, when we studied history, we studied Martin Luther King and we studied Mary McLeod Bethune and we studied Malcolm X and we studied Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman. So by the time I entered a public school where I was not in a predominantly black school, I had a completely different awareness of myself as a smart person, as an individual, because I had been nurtured by these really, really phenomenal young black people. This is the early 1970s who were born out of the struggle of the sixties and understood the power of what happens when you educate black kids about who they are and about 
where they came from. And those, those educators who can do that and see you and understand you, whether they're black or white, it's, it's, it, it changed both of our lives, as you know. Yes, it did. It's great. I mean, I can go all the way back to my grandmother and who went to Bethune-Cookman College. And she was there when she had five kids and she was not yet 25. And there's, there was somebody at Bethune-Cookman College who said, you are welcome here. Your life experience is welcome. And I am so thankful to that person who started the college going trajectory of my family um, that led to, to me. Um, and without college being a part of it, I'm thankful to the person who said yes to my, my grandmother. And you never know what saying yes to some individual is going to do for a whole family tree. And I'm so thankful to that person whose name I cannot call because I don't know their name. But they said yes to my grandmother. And that had ripple effects. And that's what, was one of the reasons why I'm so enamored of the work that you are doing. Because you are you're throwing pebbles in the water that are rippling out because you, you are saying yes to people. And I'm, it's, it's wonderful. It's critical, critically important. I, I feel like it is. Yeah. Like it's important to have people like you be a part of this process because, you know, what this will turn out to be, I don't know. I'm just saying yes to the process, you know, yeah. and I, I'm, you know, you know, I have faith <laughs> that it will be what it's supposed to be. Um, but I feel like part of, the, part of the gifts of our lives, Regina, is that we have been, I've traveled the world with you. We've sat at many dinners, dinners together. These conversations are not new to us. <laughs> mm -hmm. We've had Jane Cho and Catherine Hahn and Nicholas Pepper and Adriana Gaviria and Dara Fisher and Remy Aubergeois and Kate Nallen at these tables having these exact conversations. And these are the conversations that I think are interesting. And that I think I walk away every time we are together and I'm like, I have to go rethink my whole life. Because <laughs> 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 I've just had so much knowledge like dumped on me. And like, and like, you know, what you give is the best. And so I want to, I want, I want to give the best to people because they may not have that in their regular pedestrian life, these conversations, you know? So I want to talk a little bit about Louis Armstrong. Okay. I, I love the video, the video of the artists in the house. And they're all oh, like, yes. Yes. Oh my gosh. That video. Armstrong now. Beautiful. It, it was, it was a gift to walk into the organization where this, this, there was a desire to make sure that Louis Armstrong wasn't a figure of the past but a figure of the now and a figure of the future. And the way to do that was through Armstrong Now to commission contemporary artists to come into the house, because it's a historic house, where they, Lewis and Lucille lived for 30 years, to come into that house and to access the archives. It's the largest archive of any Black uh, jazz musician, of any jazz musician, and uh, one of the largest of any Black musician, to come into the house, come into the archives, research and create new work. And the work that was created was glorious oh. because it was about, it was interdisciplinary with musicians, dancers, poets coming together, working together when they hadn't worked together before in the midst of the coronavirus and making magic and making these films. And so Armstrong Now is, is something that has happened and will happen moving forward, because there will always be new artists who need to come into the home and discover. So I'm, I'm very excited to continue that process. What did you learn from his legacy? What are you learning from his legacy? I'm learning more about what it meant to be a Black man at the turn of the century, when the, the reverberations of slavery, that, that, that echo was loud. 
and um, and sometimes not an echo, sometimes right in front of you. And what it took to be a black man, a black entertainer, a black person that was deeply disciplined in your craft, the craft of, of the trumpet and navigate those waters. I mean, he had to navigate gangsters. He had to navigate arrests. He had to navigate poverty. And he had to still step onto a stage and blow, and yeah. blow with joy. And that is, that is worth exploring and worth investigating. So I'm, I'm learning more about that. Gina Vane. I cannot say thank you enough for your time today and your willingness to share your voice and your wisdom with us. Um, to those of you who are watching, you can follow myself on Instagram at the Patrick Huey or on LinkedIn at Patrick Huey. And remember, we all have a voice, so use yours wisely.